Say what's cracking YouTube? It's your boy 16 to life and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Yard down! Before I get started, I need y'all to do me a few favors. In the event you happen to like this video, hit that like button. Also subscribe to my page and uh, hit the notification bell. That way anytime I drop a story, you can be notified ASAP Rocky and then you can hop on it whenever you're ready. Now, for those of y'all that's new to my page, in 1994, I got arrested. I ended up doing 24 years straight in some of these California prisons. And uh, with that being said, I got some stories for y'all today. But now, now today in particular, I'm not going to go into a story. You know, I get a lot of people interested in how did I have life and how did I end up uh, coming home? So not, right here, this story was requested right here by... Um, like I say, I got a lot of comments, but one in particular was a guy who left a comment by the name of Ezequiel uh, Riviera. And he had a good, um, he had some good questions and he made some good comments saying that I should uh, try to bring forth a little bit more information for those who may have incarcerated loved ones um, in the California prison system. And how did I go about getting out? So today, that's what's going, that's what this is going to be about. I'll probably do a part two and part two. I'll go deeper into the um, the the statistics and things of that nature for those who are interested in that. I know a lot of people aren't interested in that. They just want me to get right to the meat of the story. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that right here now. OK, uh, it ain't too often that I talk about my case or my crime. And, and, and uh, it's two reasons behind that. One reason is because I have to be aware that, you know, regardless of. Um, who I was or, or what I've done back then or my thoughts on gang banging and, and things of that nature. I have to also be mindful of that. You know, um, there all, there's always going to be other people, um, hurt by my decision to speak on, you know, um, uh, a situation where a person lost their life and things of that nature. You know, um, there's always going to be friends and family members. And so I try to be mindful of that and not try to make it seem like it's a, it's a trivial it's a trivial uh, moment and it doesn't matter. Also, secondly, because I'm going to write a book and I'm going uh, to put a lot of the detailed information into the book for those who are, you know, inquisitive as to my charges and things of that nature. But so I will speak on it a little bit. Initially, I was charged with an attempted murder at a party. Excuse me. Well, um, it was three people being it was three people who were shot. And so initially I was charged with those attempted murders. Um. I also was charged, so when I initially, when I was charged with the crime, I went on the run. Um, I, I was captured a year later, and um, during, those, during, during, during the time that I was on the run, I also was charged with another murder. So now I was facing these three attempted murders at the party, and also another murder, once I finally was captured in 1994. So, like I say, subsequently, um, I went to trial on the attempted murders and I was found guilty of um, of uh, a great bodily injury, which I received nine years. And I was found guilty of an attempted of attempted murder. So I, I got nine years for the great bodily injury. I got through. I got a life sentence for the attempted murder. Like I was telling y'all. Um, I also had a trailing murder case, um, secondary to the charges that I had just been found guilty of. So now, like I say, I'm, I'm already sentenced to nine years plus life and I still have a murder charge that I have to deal with. So I stayed in the county jail another year or so going to trial for, uh, uh, you know, going to the court proceedings for this, uh, for this trailing murder case. At some point in time, they offered me 16 years. They would drop it to voluntary manslaughter. They offered me 16 years. They dropped it down to voluntary manslaughter. And they ran the 16 years concurrent with the nine years. But they ran it consecutive to the life sentence. So if that makes sense to you guys. So in a, um, to simplify it, instead of having nine plus life now, I now had 16 years plus a life sentence. And so in 1996, I entered the California prison system with a uh, 16 year plus life sentence. Now, 
by that being my first time in prison and not necessarily knowing how the laws work, I assumed that after that 16 year period or whatever, I would initially be let out of prison. Uh, I never forget. I caught I caught the chain, which means the chain means when you leave from the because uh, when you leave the county jail, they're going to send you to what's known as reception prison. That's where they receive you. Um, they analyze your case. They assess you uh, and, and they assess whatever housing they feel that that you need, whether it's minimum, maximum or whatever. And then uh, initially, eventually you're sent off to another prison. So when I left, when I left the uh, when I left reception and caught the chain to go to the actual penitentiary, me and another individual, he was an 18 year old. He had uh, he had life as well. And he had 15 plus life, 15 years to life, excuse me, 15 to life. And so he has, he assumed also after the 15 years, he'd be released. And like I told y'all in some of my stories, when I first got to Salinas, I ran in, uh, across a dude um, by the name of C. Looney, who happened to be out of Venice Shoreline. He broke it down to us and told us, no, that even though, you know, you had you had uh, 15 years uh, plus life or two life with the possibility of getting of getting paroled. The way the system was set up was that, uh, if you had life, they wasn't, you know, uh, the board wasn't get, given any lifers a parole date. So basically uh, you was trapped there for the rest of your life. Now, when I got to prison um, in 96. The uh, the governor happened to be a guy by the name of of uh, Pete Wilson. And so at some point in time, let me let me let me go back with y'all uh, at some point in time in California. And, and California is only, I believe, one of is one of three states that allows this to happen. The governor has complete control. Or the governor has power once you go to the parole board in any event, they happen to find you suitable uh, that's what they call it out here in California. When they, when they approve you to get released, they, they call it suitable. Once you're found suitable, then the governor has the power to overlook that, uh, suitability finding and say yay or nay. And so, um, governor Pete Wilson, every, uh, when, when someone would be found suitable, which was extremely rare anyway, but when someone would be, um, found suitable he had the power to reverse that decision and that's what he was doing he was reversing the the, the, uh, the decision and so um in the uh five years that that uh he was uh, um he was the governor of california in five years only eight lifers had uh had been paroled so you know basically that was basically unheard of a, a lifer a lifer getting getting parole was unheard of you know and so like i say all these prisons that California have uh, now they have 33. I don't know how many they had back in 1996 when I came, but I'm assuming maybe around 28. You know, so just consider all these 28 prisons. You know, a person is you're not, you're not even hearing about someone else. You're not even hearing about someone else who has life um, getting paroled. So with that with that mindset, you know, when you, when you came to prison, and also keep in mind when I came to prison in 1996. It was they had just started um, giving people life for three strikes. So they now they had they had they had people who were lifers, but they weren't lifers um, under the um, normal idea of having life. You know, now you had people who had life for maybe um, stealing. You know, if you had two, if you had two previous uh, violent felonies, they could give you a, your third strike could be it didn't have to be violent you know uh, the first person who i ran across that that was charged with three strikes and i told a story about him in one of my oldest uh one of my older stories was a gentleman by the name of lewis white and lewis white had three strikes for trying to steal some underwear uh from a prison i mean excuse me from a uh, from a grocery store and remember i told you in the story how he took off running and uh an employee out of the store chased him down and said, you didn't fucked up. I'm the fastest white boy in Riverside. He chased Mr. White down, tackled him and held him to the ground. And eventually Mr. White was was given uh, three uh, three strikes, 25 to life for stealing for stealing some underwear. You know, I ran across various people. Uh, you had heard about the dude who who was on the beach 
and went and took a piece of pizza from someone. They gave him they gave him um, three strikes. So you had a lot of these people who weren't traditional lifers, you know, who weren't in there for killing or whatever or, or uh, attempted attempted kidnapping and things of that nature. Now you had a whole lot of people in there, you know, with 150 years to life. So th the climate of prison, man, was um, it was horrendous, you know. And so, um, you know, imagine just being around all these people and no and, and no one is going home because the parole board and the governor had been systematically denying people. You know, they they weren't they weren't they weren't sticking to the rules. Now, I can understand you may have some people out there who are saying, OK, these guys is going to prison. They, these guys been out here. They've been killing people or they've been breaking the law and they're in prison. And that's fine. And, you know, I understand that. You know, I understand that there are rules and regulations in this society that we all must abide by. And when we don't abide by the rules and the regulations of this society, of course, there are going to be consequences. I understand that, you know, uh, um, these rules and laws are kept in place um, to prevent people from doing certain things like that and just just, you know, just running ramshod through the community. But my problem is this here. When you do have the laws in place. Then they should also the, the lawmakers should also stick to the laws. And so what I mean by that is if the judge sentences, sentences a person to life with the possibility of parole, once that person has um, done the necessary steps, you know, to regain his freedom, he should be able to regain his freedom. And that that's something that was not happening at the time of my incarceration, you know, the. Uh, the parole board was making many excuses to prevent a person to gain his freedom. And so uh, Pete Wilson, he was unfairly den denying people par uh, parole. Like I said, I think he gave and I got some notes down here, but he gave uh, eight, eight, eight lifers, eight lifers parole in five year period. Now, after after him came another California governor by the name of Gray Davis and Gray Davis outright said it. He said that. If you're in here, if you're in prison for murdering somebody, forget it. You know, so they they had no they had no um, intention on letting anybody, regardless of his prison record, of how well he had changed his life. You know, uh, they had no no they had no intentions of freeing that person. And so, like I say, um, eventually um, they had they had put in a whole bu bunch of laws that was uh, unfair, a whole bunch of laws that was um, keeping people in prison. So also now, keep in mind, if a person you come to prison with people with all this time and you know that you're not going to get out, it's definitely going to affect the way that you act in prison. You know, I mean, when they put you around the worst of the worst, you know, uh, you got to survive up in there. And what you already thinking that I'm not going home, it's not any incentive for you to do the right thing. And so when a person would get when a person would eventually, you know, because if you sentenced to 15 years to life. I believe you had to do 14 years before they would take you to your parole hearing to talk about uh, regaining your freedom. But now every little incident that had happened during that time, they was going to hold against you. So if you had if you had stabbed somebody, you know, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, they was going to talk about that and discuss that. If you had got a write up for a, maybe a guard that told you to get out of the shower 10 years ago, you took your time or you didn't get out. Fast enough for the guards liking. He wrote you up about it. They was using all these incidents to deny a person from coming home. But uh, eventually, several lifers who had been um, unfairly denied parole over and over and over started filing lawsuits. And those are some of the things that opened up the gate and eventually made it, made it possible for lifers like myself to come home. There was a um, there was one uh, inmate by the name of Sandra Lawrence Davis. And she ended up filing a lawsuit. And I believe it was ruled on in 2008. And what the judge ruled is that the parole board could no longer deny a person parole strictly on the crime alone. Because that was a trick that the parole board would use. They would say, oh, this person's crime is too heinous and we're denying you for that crime. But like I said, once you got sentenced at trial, if the judge found it within the law to give you life with parole, the parole board should not be arbitrarily able to just uh, deny you because they didn't like something that you done or they wanted to keep you in prison. And so this was part of the lawsuit that was filed by her by her. Also, 
another lawsuit that was filed and ruled upon in the inmates' favor around that time. And I forget the, the name of the guy, but the law was basically that the parole board had to consider your volunteer work in prison and also your prison record. So basically they had to consider the good things that you have been doing since you was in prison and if you were staying disciplinary free and things like that. So um, how I ended up being able to parole, it was another law that ended up coming into play. And the name of that law was called the Youth Offender Parole Hearing Law. And what that law was basically was initially if you had co committed a crime and was sentenced to life under the age of 18, they had done a study where they said the brain, the part of the brain that helps you recognize maturity stops you from being impulsive and acting on a whim and uh, the part of the brain that helps you to appreciate the consequences for your actions had not fully developed yet. And so eventually they ended up extending that law to anybody who had committed their crime under the age of 26. And so what they started doing then is they started giving uh, eventually over a period of time, they started giving convicts a fair trial and they started Take, taking those, uh, excuse me, a fair, um, a fair parole board hearing. And they started deeply taking those things into consideration. And eventually that's how I was let out. But also you have to stay out of trouble for about five years, you know, which is extremely hard in prison because, you know, it's sad, but it's true that, you know, when some dudes know that you have life and they know that any little thing can get you denied for three years, Five years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years. And that's something that I failed to speak on too. Uh, around 2008, 2009, California voted on a law that was called Marcy's Law, 